Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Afikra Conversations. Our special guest is Mustafa Minawi, who is the author of two books that we are very, very excited to talk about. He's a professor and scholar of the Ottoman Empire. And the two books we're discussing is Losing Istanbul, Arab, Ottoman, Imperialist, and the End of an Empire, and The Ottoman Scramble for Africa, Empire and Diplomacy in the Sahara and the Hejaz. Mustafa, welcome to Afikra Conversations. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, reaching out and and wanting to explore those ideas further. I'm excited. I really am excited. So um, let's start with, um, you know, what, let's start with some, a little sort of um, guide on your, on what shaped your perspective and what shaped your curiosity in the region. Growing up, were you curious about the Ottoman Empire? And if so, why? Uh, so the short answer is no. Uh, no, because we really, I didn't know anything about the Ottoman Empire. I basically, um, like most people going through the um, uh, elementary and secondary education system in Lebanon, we don't learn about the Ottoman Empire. We learn about the Turks, the bad Turks that came and occupied. Usually it's about a, a chapter uh, and we skip into uh, Fakhriddin or something like that. <laughs> that makes it sound like there's some proto uh, Lebanese uh, uh, identity that always existed and was just, you know, hanging out at the mountains somewhere. Um, of course, it is. It's uh, the reason we don't we don't learn about it is for a lot of uh, for, I mean, most of the regions that were part of the former Ottoman Empire do not learn or at least learn and have very, very specific versions of history uh, under Ottoman rule. Um, so I honestly did not know anything about the Ottoman Empire, with the exception of some few things that my great grandma and grandpa used to talk about who lived through the Ottoman Empire. Um, uh, but it was just like I if I I. It was just faint ideas, um, mostly of things that have passed, uh, detached from our existence, our reality at the time. Um, it felt almost like it's a different planet, not just a different time. Um, and uh, and I think that's by design. So the time when I started getting curious about the Ottoman Empire, uh, uh, officially, at least in an academic way, happened uh, almost by accident much, much later in life. Uh, uh, while I was in Canada, of all places. Interesting. You know, it's funny because um, I'm calling you from Beirut right now. And when I think of empire and when I think of imperialism and sort of colony, um, I think of the French. I think of the British. I think of the Belgian. I think of the Spanish, the Portuguese. I don't think of the Ottomans. Why is that? Do you think that's a fair conclusion to come to? And like, why? Why did that happen? No, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, this is this is how it's been. Uh, even uh, even scholarship that has been coming out over the last say fifty years, but more uh, more importantly, or possibly over the last twenty years, that uses Ottoman archives extensively, um, still does not talk about the Ottoman Empire as an imperial power. Um, and uh, uh, and an imperial power, I say this without uh, without uh, giving it those characteristics that we associate with with uh, uh, automatically almost assume about about uh, colonialism or imperialism. This is not about me talking about the horrors of colonialism or the horrors of imperialism. This is about me just stating a fact that uh, the Ottoman Empire was very much an imperial power that was part of a larger imperial system of being, an imperial system of rule that dominated um, uh, the world really for uh, over well, well, well over a thousand years before uh, um, uh, uh, the more recent notions of nationalism started to creep up and idea of a nation state came in. So just stating that the Ottoman Empire, literally in the title, is uh, is an is an imperial power or one that that ruled as an empire, uh, funny enough, still feels strange to our ears and and definitely controversial to a lot of other ears that are more kind of uh, um, uh, uh, how I put it? Uh, nationalists in different ways. Yeah. Um, uh, now, it, it is important to make the distinction just because they are imperial, that doesn't make them the same kind of imperialism as the French or the same kind of imperialism as the British or the Italians or the Russians or whatever, but they're imperial nonetheless, and they operated that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a semantic difference, but it's a it's an important one. It's a very um, important one. Yeah. 
Let's talk a little bit about the first book. So those who are seeing the screen, the book on the right came out in 2016. Losing Assemble, I think, is coming out in a few months. Yeah, um, so December. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the Ottoman scramble for Africa. And before we get into this idea, I was I, you had me at at the title. I have to say, um, <laughs> but tell me why the word scramble is so intentional here. I mean, it's referencing a, a kind of a specific well-known concept, at least in Western academia, about a, a, a about a period when we, quote unquote, there was this scramble for Africa. So it's a very set term that conjures up uh, basically late imperialism. So uh, uh, 18th century, mid 18th century, all the way till I would say just before World War One, when um, it seems that there was a discussion rather than just like a land grab. There was a discussion between Europe. European powers about quote their right to rule <laughs> and how are they going to divvy up uh, uh, lands in the global south but particularly in Africa uh, the, without uh, causing conflict about, uh, amongst themselves since there was a lot more players that were actually coming in that started to believe in the notion that in, to be an empire one has to have a colony um, um, and uh, what I'm saying in this book is that the Ottomans did step in and in a way stepped up to the to to this new form of understanding world power and whether and basically um if you're an empire a global empire that chooses to remain competitive as a global empire uh it will have to participate in this new global system in which you're either uh say uh, what i say you're either um a, a colonizer or colon, uh, colonialable, I don't know how to put it, like an, you could be easily, you're either ruled or could be ruled. Your sovereignty is either questioned or you make sure your sovereignty is not questioned by questioning others' sovereignty. So it's, a uh, yeah. So um, lay, the, lay the groundwork, if you will, um, and sort of draw the map because maps, the importance of certain cities and hubs have changed over time, but in some, in some ways they haven't. So, mm -hmm. If you would, uh, please give us a sense of what the map is. What are the important locations that help um, help us understand their ambition, um, their imperial ambition in Africa? So uh, first, I have to I have to make the remember the Ottomans have been in Africa for a very very long time, um, uh, uh, and uh, they have provinces in Africa. And I want to make the distinction clear between province and colony. For the Ottomans, it was a clear distinction. So a province, uh, say having the Libya what, what I call the Libyan province, Trablusgarp, uh, which has other kind of administrative sections within it, which is kind of the center of where the story happens, but also Egypt and of course Tunisia and before that Algeria uh, in in uh, they were undisputed uh, administrative zones of the Ottoman Empire um and I say administrative zones because they had different relationship to the center but they very much were considered from at least Istanbul's perspective as as part and parcel of this uh, of Ottoman domain um Ottoman domain official proper um where I am talking uh, what the where I'm bringing the discussion here is is about the Ottomans saying that we are now going from our official domain, in this case, the coast of, uh, of North Africa, deeper into the African continent, uh, into sub-Saharan Africa, to, part, to try and get what they call, uh, what they start to kind of create this word for it, which is a, a possession or a, a colony. Um, it's really the equivalent of a, qual a colony in, an, in English discourse. Um, and that's where this book takes us. So it takes us not from when the Ottomans, the Ottomans have always been there, or at least they've been there since the uh, early 16th century, or I should say mid 16th century, depending on where you are in, in North Africa. Uh, but they are going further south, further in into, into sub-Saharan Africa. So the, the center of my story is actually the Eastern Sahara, the border region. It's what is now, uh, uh, if you go south from um, uh, uh, Benghazi, and 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 go all the way south to 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 hit basically what is today Chad, if you will. This is where the story is is. Well, this is where the the geographical center of the story is, and this is the geographical center of what the Ottomans were claiming should be legally 
their possession because it is part of their uh, uh, um, uh, uh, sphere of influence. And as a sovereign power that is part of a European colonial uh, competition, legally, according to the to some of the rules that were established in 1885, it should be now considered theirs without competition from either the British on one side or the French on the other side. So, so that, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I have two questions. One, if you can just uh, put a pin into the idea of 1885, what, what happens in 1885? And then I want to ask a question about how is there, what were the, the differences between their techniques for expansion in the 16th, in the 16th century when they got to Benghazi and they got to North Africa? And right. what was this sort of new approach and, um, how did that happen? How did the new approach sort of come to bear? No, absolutely. So we never think, I mean, part of the reason we don't think of the uh, Ottoman Empire as an empire in the same sense as the French and the British is because the French and the British are, uh, we, they are new, uh, right? <laughs> They're new imperials. Uh, the Ottoman Empire kind of straddles, like the Russian Empire, straddles both what we think of as like uh, old imperialism with new imperialism, which started to actually question the notion of 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 what it is to be sovereign. What are the what are borders? Uh, do we respect the notion of borders? Um, if we go for uh, who gets to have uh, the privilege of sovereignty within their borders, and who does not get to get the privilege of assumed sovereignty within their own borders. So all of these ideas start to come up much later. So the notion of expanding after being more or less with, within stable boundaries that were more or less agreed on with other European powers is where this is different. This is actually expanding with the notion of going beyond the Ottoman Empire into new possessions, as opposed to in the past, which is your reason, uh, um, your reason for existing is to continuously be in a state of defending what you have and expanding further. The, there is no such thing as boundaries in old imperialism. To be an empire, that means you're an expansionist empire. Uh, and and of course, at, at a certain point in 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 I would say late 18th, early to, uh, or early 19th century, that idea that you're always in constant state of expansion or ex uh, or um, you're 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 in within a kind of a, you're trying to pretend what you have what protect what you have started to to morph into the idea that there are people that get to expand and people that do not and the ottomans took them a while to 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 actually sign on to this idea especially since they were themselves the object of 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 uh, ambitions from from european powers both territorial and and to kind of assert their sovereignty in other ways economic cultural and so on it's so almost like, yeah, from like a business sense, it's almost like user acquisition versus like company acquisition. Like Netflix is like, we're just trying to expand our users, expand our users. And then they're like, no, we are going to buy these companies. I know it's very interesting. And it's a hostile takeover versus, uh, you know, going to the board. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Very, very interesting. Um, let's talk a little bit about how you did the research. I mean, um, when did you decide that this is what you're trying to get into? And then how did you do this research? Where were you looking at archives, et cetera? So the bread and butter of the first book and the second book, uh, actually, most of us that, that I can identify as historians of the Ottoman Empire, we're very lucky to have access to the Ottoman state archives that are that um, are housed in Istanbul um, uh, and are relatively very accessible. Uh, and depending on who you ask, uh, are becoming more um, organized, so easier to search. Uh, they're definitely more accessible online. Um, so it's a it's a rich it's like this obsessive richness of collection of information that the Ottomans kept. Um, and that the Turkish state, the modern Turkish state, is 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 taking care of as a guardian state, but that's or as a let's call it a um, uh, how should I put it. Um, an inheritor of empire. Uh, and it makes it accessible actually to researchers with exceptions, uh, but with researchers, for the most part, it's relatively easy to go in and do it. What you do need 
is about five or six years of picking up Turkish and then picking up Ottoman uh, 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 Turkish. And that is where the rarity or uh, Ottoman Turkish is dead, is very dead. So uh, learning a dead language is very, very difficult and it requires <laughs> nobody's going to be like, oh, I'm just going to hang out at home and, and figure out how to read Turkish, even though some people do do that. And please don't do that because <laughs> uh, uh, you have because <laughs> Ottoman Turkish looks Arabic, but it's not Arabic. Please don't pretend it's Arabic. So because uh, you end up with a lot of problems in, in a lot of the books that we have. Anyhow, um, uh, so basically you pick it up and then most of the research that you do ends up being state centered in my case anyway, at least at this early uh, project. So that's where the most of the research is done. It's done in Istanbul and all of the other places with the, in the orbit of Istanbul or Ankara where they've kept some of the documents related to what you're doing or not. Um, uh, thankfully, and I think in most cases, people that are not working on uh, a, a Turkish speaking areas of the empire usually have to have another language, uh, the local or vernacular provincial language, if you will, that is more commonly used in, in, in whichever province you're working on. In my case, of course, it's Arabic. And of course, I have, uh, because I Arabic is, 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 is my native tongue, I can, it's much easier for me to access those documents, but they're just not as available and they're not as plentiful. So I did a lot of research in Damascus back when you could, and uh, uh, that was really rough, even back when, uh, you know, <laughs> You, uh, you could. Um, uh, as a, uh, so the difference between doing research in Istanbul and doing research in Damascus, even though both have quote unquote national archives is day and night, right? Uh, but you have to uh, uh, use some uh, um, Arabic language sources or some local sources because otherwise you are completely privileging a very, very, very specific kind of state-centered, or I should say, let's call it federal, or, or let's not call it federal, people will come after me, an imperial uh, um, uh, uh, perspective as opposed to all of the other information that you can get from other places. Interesting. How did you um, get a sense of what, um, what the sort of quote-unquote locals, um, how th what their reaction was to the Ottoman sort of ambition. When you're looking at, you know, what we have on the map here, when you're looking at sort of um, what is now modern day Libya, and, and you talk about Chad as, as well, like, how did you access that if uh, you're mostly focusing on stuff from the local archives? I'm sure it's something you've thought through. I, I thought through, and it's like the biggest... Um... I don't know. It's the biggest weakness, if you will, of the book. Uh, I don't have, it's very much an imperial uh, uh, expansion book about what the empire was trying to do as an empire from Istanbul. Um, now, uh, I did not, unfortunately, while I was doing the, the research, I did not have access to the Libyan archives for obvious reasons. Um, uh, uh, but I, at, and at one point I had to commit to the notion, to the idea, which I tried to explain really at the beginning, but it's not, uh, um, I'm not sure if it's good enough to, to just say, Hey, I'm, this is an, an empire book about an imperial perspective from the center. We just don't know this specific imperial perspective about expansion in Africa. Now, how about people in Tbisti? How about people in Wadai? How about people in Darfur? How about, uh, it's uh, the all of the voices are almost absent, um, uh, 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 with with the exception of some of the things that I found um, either with people talking about what the uh, 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 local uh, leaders were thinking or doing or whatever. So that would be in the British archives, sometimes in the Ottoman archives, but it's reports about what they are doing or thinking, whatever, from an imperial perspective, whether it's British, French, or Ottoman. Uh, uh, so with I have loved to, you know, 100%, I would love to. It still is something that I, that I think is doable, um, uh, that I try to remedy uh, in a, by shifting my focus completely in the second book, by shifting the, the kind of uh, the unit of analysis but, uh, by, by uh, and in many ways trying to get rid of the, the, this uh, uh, fetishization, I call it, of the Ottoman archives to become, to come down to the level of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis in, in someone's life, or in this case, diplomats' life who happen to be from, uh, from uh, um, representing powers and substance Saharan Africa, which this book does not have. Let me ask you a question about um, 
the legacy of imperialism. Um, it seems like in places like Lebanon, for example, um, we're constantly reminded uh, about the sort of the legacy of the French uh, French colonialism um, in often problematic ways, but sometimes it's embedded in sort of the heritage that we that we celebrate. Um, I feel like Ottoman imperialism in so many ways is forgotten. Mm -hmm. And does that speak to it as a failed imperialist project or why, why is it forgotten? Uh, it's a, that's a great question. Uh, it's forgotten because it's, it's made to be forgotten. Like how should I put it? It is, uh, <laughs> it is, it's, uh, it is, they want you to forget it. I mean, literally. Who's, who's the they? Who's the oh, they? So that's a great, that's a great question. So when, when the, when the people writing history, or when I say people, I mean, really literally politicians, a few number of people that were writing the textbooks during the, um, uh, the, uh, Mithak, you know, the, 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 when they all got together and said, we're all going to live together and the rich people are going to stay rich and the poor people are going to stay poor, but we're going to make it look like we're, we're all one good people. Uh, part of that structure is that you need to have uh, a boogeyman that you actually do not, uh, um, or, yeah. or uh, uh, you, you do not name. It is abstract because the moment you actually start digging into it, you'll find out that that boogeyman is made of a lot of people, including locals uh, that were part of the, <laughs> the imperial structure. Uh, so you, that does not serve your purpose if you are trying to create a, a, a nation state with a sense of nationalism that somehow binds these people that are bound but with it under an imperial context that you want to bind them now under a national context. So a lot of the textbooks uh, purposely either avoid completely uh, or what they do is that they tell you a very specific story that sounds uh, uh, general. What do I mean by this? They don't say we're going to skip over, say, four centuries of Ottoman history. They say we're going to tell you vignettes from this place called Lebanon that has always existed and was under occupation, but the occupiers are terrible. Let's talk about very specific leaders that were Iktachis. It, I mean, they, that were essentially feudal lords uh, that we are going to now excavate and, and turn into national heroes within this, con uh, while pretending that there's no such thing on top of them, or that they are not assigned by the central government or are paying taxes to the central government. And many times, doing the bidding of the central government. Uh, so that distorts history completely. And, and I understand that in some cases it's necessary, particularly in, a, in fragile new uh, nation states that are trying to, including the United States, <laughs> where we're trying to pretend certain things did not happen, certain things happen, and somehow we are a people because of these specific things, including these moments in time. Having Ottoman rule as part, not on top of Lebanon, but part of Lebanon, actually takes away from that mission. So uh, uh, where where things where uh, so I, uh, that project is understandable, but where it becomes re a lot less understandable is after uh, so many years. We're still talking in those specific things. We're still their textbooks have barely changed, and the discourse is still the same, which means we did not take ownership of our history, if we're talking about Lebanon or if, of our history, if we're talking about Syria, our history, if we're talking about Palestine, we did not take the full thing, including our participation in an imperial construct that was that was not uh, top down, but uh, no, it was very much top down. What I mean by that is that it wasn't just exclusively done uh, through one quote unquote ethnic group, which in this case we refer to as the Turk, right? It was, uh, it was a, a collaboration. The collaboration sounds very kumbaya, my lord. That's not, it's a, it's very much uh, uh, the people on top were as, as mixed as the people at the bottom. Uh, and if we pretend otherwise, we're, we're assigning um, false history to our own people and detaching ourselves from things that we actually can relate to and more importantly, things that we can take ownership of. Uh, in our very, very recent history, literally, I, I remember my great grandma, my grandpa. You understand what I mean? Like we, I had conversations with them. These are people that have lived through the transition and we pretend that they don't exist or we pretend that they, that they were on a different planet. These are people that lived both through the transition and the Sefer Belik that we all talk about. Uh, or uh, you know what Sefer Belik is? Maybe it's a generational thing. Uh, go, go ahead and explain to people who don't know. 
Oh, Sefer Berlik. Uh, so Sefer Berlik literally it just means the uh, mobilization in Turkish, right? But in in within uh, the Levant, particularly in Lebanon and Palestine, particularly Lebanon, Sefer Berlik has a very uh, has a very specific like they do it with a capital <laughs> S, and it is about a very very specific moment in which uh, forced mobilization took place during World War One, and the Arabs or Arabic speaking people of the Ottoman Empire or from Arab majority provinces such as uh, Beirut and uh, the province of Damascus and the province of Aleppo and, the, and of course Mount Lebanon were horribly treated. Ca uh, and and they were horribly treated and they were taken on uh, uh, en, uh, en masse to other fronts, including Gallipoli, particularly Gallipoli, actually Gallipoli. Most of the people that died ended up being actually from Arab provinces because that was the policy. The policy is that you take people from, say, Anatolia and you put them in Yemen and you take people from there, you know, because you don't want them to run away from the front. The thing is uh, that those years, those horrific years where not just this was happening, but also a lot of uh, 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 there was a, a European led embargo, of course, that, led, that caused a lot of starvation. We had uh, uh, the famine in Mount Lebanon, which my grandma survived and and people would talk about in the 70s and 80s. This happened at the same time as the Sefer Berlik has happened and everything became in the imagination of the people as the Sefer Berlik. The Turks doing this horrible thing during the days of famine and taking away our men and taking away our supplies because they would actually ration the army supplies with some of the, uh, you know, it's, uh, it happened not just in the air world, it happened in Anatolia and other places. But horrific years of horror that then imprinted on 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 uh, 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 on on the memory of a whole generation that came afterwards, um, in many ways, forgetting more four hundred plus years of not coexistence, but actually being part of a different political structure. So Beirut was a province. <laughs> so Beiruti, that we call Beiruti, for example. Is uh, is mixed with so much Turkish because it was a central province. Um, Damascus, same thing. Sorry, I don't want to. But I don't want to. What I'm trying to say is that 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 moment, that rupture, the hor the horror of World War One, which we again do not talk about enough, uh, is uh, uh, that actually affected. There is no region that died that had more deaths proportionally according to the population more than the Middle East during World War One. Nowhere else, not even Europe, not so. And we really rarely talk about it because about we'd rather it. forget about this and move on to suddenly we've we've found our independence and now we're a new nation state. Um, uh, do you get? Uh, I yeah, hope. Yeah. So does that? That's very. Thank you, Mustafa. That's very helpful to think through. Is that the same uh, true across uh, Alexandria, Cairo, Benghazi, like across in very the, different ways? So, so tell me why. Uh, so uh, in North Africa, it's, uh, it depends on where you are. First of all, of course, Tunisia uh, w uh, was occupied by France much, much earlier than anywhere else. There was a huge, very, very uh, violent program of, of, uh, 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 of colonization that happened uh, in, in Algeria and Tunisia. A lot of refugees, a lot of people that you, we, that you have in the Middle East, in Palestine and in Lebanon, uh, whose last name, say, is uh, Jazairi or... Uh, you know, at Tunis and whatever, all of these are uh, tons of refugees that came flooding into the Ottoman Empire from uh, those uh, after the French occupied both of these places. Uh, uh, but their connection to the state, a connection to Istanbul was much, much uh, 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 more tenuous than than the connection of places, say, like Beirut or Damascus or Aleppo. Uh, uh, Aleppo, Damascus, uh, I mean, I'm using those uh, those cities because those are uh, administrative uh, provincial cities cities, major provincial cities that were in many ways closer to Istanbul than, say, Ankara um, uh, uh, um, and uh, back in, during the Ottoman period. Ankara was a village like in, in the middle, you know, so uh, uh, but Damascus, uh, Beirut as a provincial when it became a provincial center, uh, Aleppo when it became a provincial center, um, uh, Jerusalem naturally, including Yaffa as its port, all of these places were a lot more tied to Istanbul and its reforms and, and top down than, uh, than say places like Benghazi, which went through the Tanzima, 
not. That's a whole other thing. But but dropped off the map much earlier. And and of course, Egypt. Egypt went remains uh, uh, officially a province of the Ottoman Empire all the way till World War One. But it in many ways is granted almost full autonomy. Or at least internal autonomy. Uh, um, is it Muhammad and, Ali? Is that why? Uh, yeah. So after uh, um, Muhammad Ali or Muhammad Ali, it's uh, you believe it or not, how you say it is controversial. After Muhammad Ali, it's uh, it uh, the. Uh, uh, he decides to create basically uh, uh, his own dynasty under Ottoman rule in very similar ways to what was what happened early, much earlier in in Libya, uh, uh, and w- who had the Karamandas uh, Karam, uh, dynasty, which is a, a family that comes actually from from Anatolia. Uh, similar thing with the with the uh, with Tunisia and so on. But they but uh, Egypt became a special case because of. Uh, um, uh, the, the kind of global situation or a geopolitical situation that Egypt was uh, embroiled in, including first French occupation and later uh, British interest. And Abdul, uh, Mehmed Ali took the, uh, the opportunity to actually create an autonomous state. He was a Pasha. Basically, if, uh, according to he needs to get the the pasha look uh, renewed from the Ottoman Empire. He needs to pay taxes to the Ottoman Empire, but he was creating an an autonomous region uh, that that had its own orbit of power and theoretically though should not be negotiating with foreign powers because just like any autonomous region that is given its own autonomy, you're autonomous, but you're not allowed to negotiate with you're uh, you're autonomous internally, but you're not allowed to negotiate with other powers. But what's happening in Egypt parallels in many ways what's happening in Istanbul and in and other big cities or other big uh, uh, governments that were uh, um, provincial governments that were trying to actually kind of exert reforms in the 19th century and early 20th century. Uh, but their relationship to Istanbul is very, very different than, again, Beirut, uh, uh, Aleppo, uh, uh, Damascus, and of course, uh, you know, Izmir and so on, uh, which we assume that their relationship is closer to it just because of the, you know, the, our kind of... Uh, the proximity. Uh, exactly, exactly. Okay, um, let's keep on going because I want to talk a little bit about losing Istanbul. Um sure. What is the what is the sort of the thesis or the reason this book exists? Oh, that's a great that's a great question. So this is the first time I'm talking about this book. Funny enough, uh, uh, publicly, I've, I mean, I've I've chewed the ear of a lot of people who are friends of mine <laughs> that have, that uh, that while I was writing it. So it is a book. Um, it's a book that I thought would never actually come about because I uh, I have been obsessed with a few members uh, of this of the Azim Zade family for a very long time. People that have read the first book would know that the main dude that you that whose picture you showed is Sadiq Azim Zade. Uh, but in this book, I don't really go into who he is. Um, I go into what he did. Um, in in um, in the in my more recent book, Losing Istanbul, I go into the family in, in depth over a period of 40 years and how that family that became very much an Istanbul family, like hardcore part of the imperial uh, center, uh, very invested in the survival of the empire, very invested in the expansion of the empire uh, uh, over a period of 40 years starts to find itself on the on the on the margins of of uh, of society or the margins of imperial imperial society in Istanbul because of this thing that was emerging at that time, which is what, which is what I call ethno-racial uh, differentiation. So this idea that an ethne exists, that there is that if you're a Turk, you're different than Arab. And not only are you different, there's, a, uh, there's stratification. Uh, religion is no longer the only defining uh, um, uh, way that the Ottoman Empire, or uh, at least unofficially, viewed its subjects. Um, and how does that impact this family? That ends up being that ends up imploding uh, uh, as the as the empire itself imploded. Um, so it's a it's a very very personal um, engagement with a family that loses its core, uh, loses Istanbul. But in many ways, it's it's also kind of a a, a way of of reminding those uh, that are in 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 particularly in the Arab speaking world there are in the Arab I mean the Arab world such a problematic term I hate using it uh, but uh, in in let's call it the uh, the Arabic speaking majority places in that you know because uh, well, I mean we could talk about this that's a whole other podcast. Um, 
their disconnect, their their life imploded before it got reconstituted into neat little, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it neat, very, very messy unit, messy units called Lebanese and Syrian and Palestinian and so on. Uh, and here I'm tracing it from the center through this family that is originally from Damascus, that that is very much part of it's as Ottoman as it gets. Um, uh, including uh, good, bad, and ugly is what I call it. I mean, I go into the very ugly stuff that, of what it is to be uh, an imperial lord, right? Um, through their lives. Um, and, and, and then it implodes when the empire implodes, and then there is an erasure. Uh, a forgetfulness, an intentional forgetfulness of, of, a, uh, of an otherwise very much shared history of the region. Um, yeah, it's almost so let me let me try to say that back to you. So this is a family. This is taking place in the 1800s in Damascus, right? No. What, what years are we talking about? Uh, so it is taking place in the 1800s in Istanbul. In uh, Istanbul. But the yeah. family is Damascene. The family is originally Damascene. That's the thing. There's a lot of people that have written on, on Lazums. Uh, I, I like saying it this way because people like to say that to me. Uh, it's a Lazum, you mean? Yes, of course it's a Lazum. But guess what? The family that was part of the uh, imperial center did not refer to itself as a Lazum. They referred to themselves with this kind of uh, uh, Osman Lich, uh, like... Um, uh, 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 there are, of course, you know, uh, kind of, uh, there's a code switching that I talk about. There's a, when you're in Istanbul, you're Azimzad, uh, right? Uh, you're part of this. Uh, Mustafa, what does that mean? Azim, uh, it literally means al-Azim. Like uh, the, the peep Azade is, is a very common uh, uh, um, additive that you find in Persian uh, last names still today. Uh, uh, but now in, in Turkey, after the name law in Turkey, a lot of the names that, that, that had, that did not, that were deemed to not be Turkish uh, when the purification of the language happened. Uh, 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 so if it sounded Arabic or if it sounded um, Persian, uh, it uh, or has the Persian isafet, this is or a or an Arabic al. Uh, they were they were you had to choose a different name. So a lot of the people who are Azamzadis choose chose a different name, and I know that name, but I don't discuss it in the book. Uh, um, uh, 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 but uh, uh, in but during Ottoman periods, if you're in uh, in Istanbul, most of the times uh, that uh, you go from speaking Arabic in Damascus, coming back to Istanbul, you're back to Turkish, and zade. Is is a way of of signaling uh, uh, belonging to an Ottoman uh, Turco Ottoman existence, uh, in which zade literally means it's like Olu. Have you heard of the like uh, Shay Olu? It's the the sons of or the tribe of. In this mm. case, zade is the the people of Al Azams. That's what the, that's literally what it means, okay. but with a different formulation. But language in an in a multilingual empire mattered a lot. How you signal yourself mattered a lot. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's like it's like um, everybody calls me Mikey, um, and a lot of times people ask me. They say like, "Is that your full name?" And I always, I always laugh because I'm like, "No, obviously it's not my my real my full name is Michael." But what they're actually asking, the subtext of what they're asking, that I that flies over my head yes. was, "Is your name actually Muhammad?" Yes, absolutely. That's exactly. <laughs> I was like, I, it just yeah, yeah, floats over me always. <laughs> no, I, so I that's the code switching, right? That is the code switching. And we yeah. do it all the time. Like when I'm here, I'm my name is Mustafa. And and when I'm back in, in Lebanon or in Istanbul, I'm Mustafa. And I don't even think about the fact that I just code switched by doing yeah. Mustafa for a you know for someone to be like one, two, three, got it. <laughs> to someone yeah. who's familiar with it. Um the difference here is that the you're uh, you go from a place where that was almost organic to a time when that was political in the period of 40 years. And that's what I trace. Okay. So let's go back to that moment. The, the question I wanted to ask was, okay, so I'm speaking to this family. I take a time machine. I go back in time. I'm sitting with them in their living room. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I ask them, um, I'm trying to get a sense. They would describe themselves as being Ottoman first and foremost. Yes. And in addition, we are Damascene and we are Arabic 100%. speakers. We're all these different things. But first and foremost, we're Ottoman. Obviously, we're Ottoman. 
where Ottoman, obviously, because they are part of the imperial center. Let me be very clear. I don't want someone to be like, what do you mean? Someone who is like in a village outside of Aleppo, smoking a shisha and thinking, oh, I am Ottoman fur. No, people are thinking I'm from this village. Uh, um, but here in Istanbul, at this moment in time, being Ottoman, expressing Ottomanness, <laughs> actually it, it kind of, uh, it, I mean, obsessively uh, uh, coming back and saying, I'm Ottoman, I'm Ottoman, I'm Ottoman, becomes more insistent. Uh, incessant as being Ottoman starts to, in one way or another, start to equate to being Turkish. And if you're not, you have to really, really make sure that people get it. So I'm Ottoman. I'm, of course, I'm Ottoman. So a lot of what I do is go through the writings and figure out what words does this dude use? Where is the word Arab? What does Arab mean at that moment in time? What does it become a derogatory word in Turkish? How does that get racialized then in Turkish? How is this? How are we inheritors of that moment in time and, and the way we think about it? For the, for many of us that spend a lot of time in Istanbul and think of Istanbul our, our, as, as our home in one way, we own Istanbul in our own way. This loss will make a lot of sense. So interesting. So it's it's sort of like the the famous Ronald Reagan uh, quote where he says, "I didn't leave the Democratic Party; the Democratic Party left me." <laughs> That's interesting. Yes. So in 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 a way, yes. Remember, <laughs> these are the this is the generation that tried really hard and ended up dying trying to say what's what the world their their very existence, their very notion of who they are that they've built everything based on. To, re, uh, to to assert and 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 uh, um, what's the word to 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 make sure that there is no doubt to solidify has, it's 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 solidified suddenly implodes and it implodes within I would say about a decade it starts from like just little things to uh, uh, all the way at the end the family is interned in 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 which we don't talk about. A lot of these families that were very much part of the Ottoman imperial rule that ended up being uh, uh, Arab or, or, or uh, uh, particularly in the Arab world, in, in we're talking here Syria, like the hard <laughs> Syria, Beirut and so on, that were never suspect, became very suspect. And they, the family is taken into places like Konya and Bursa and whatever and interned during World War I. Um, so they go from being the ones that are actually kind of uh, um, uh, 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 reinforcing, actually producing Ottoman imperialism to the ones that are actually uh, the, that are on the outside that have to be controlled because they become suspect. Amazing. Okay, so on another, we're going to have to have another podcast about this because I want to ask you about at some point how this connects to the emergence of Arab nationalism and how that may be a reaction to this at some point. Uh, yes, uh, let me. <laughs> we're going to have to do it later. Hold on. Okay, Let's sure. We're going to let's do the quick sure. Q&A and then we have a couple of questions from the audience, but we're going to most of all, we're going to have to do another session because sure. there's a lot there. Um, OK, what are you reading right now, reading or watching these days? What am I reading and watching? Oh, my God, I'm watching. Embarrassingly, I'm watching <laughs> I'm watching Borgen, uh, which is uh, a Danish uh, uh, political drama uh, that I find fascinating. I'm a little obsessed with Scandinavia. Don't ask. I have no idea. The hair does not come from there. Um, so I, uh, I that's what I've been watching. Reading, I'm on the book uh, prize uh, uh, committee for Ottoman Turkish Studies Association. So I've been reading some amazing books and I don't want to give it away because we're about to make decisions. There are some amazing books, some of which actually are st a lot of my colleagues for some reason think that I only work on the Arab world or that I work on the Arab world. If you look at what I do, I actually don't work on the Arab world. Um, but they, so I end up being assigned uh, Arab Ottoman uh, books. So I'm reading uh, some fabulous uh, books about uh, um, um, Ottoman uh, Arab provinces, uh, particularly cool. uh, in the in the early modern period. If you want recommendations on more, well, than we're going to have to have them on the series when uh, once yeah. Uh, yeah. once uh, you can let us know who they are. Um, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Oh dear God, what um, shadow for a day? Oh, I've never, I don't have heroes, right? So I don't have any 
I don't, uh, unfortunately, if you're a historian, uh, if you're a historian that has heroes, I'm a little suspect of you. Uh, because <laughs> if you're a historian, you start to find out that it's, uh, everybody is flawed, and some of them are horribly, cruelly very flawed. Yeah. Um, so I don't have heroes that I want to shadow. I mean, there are, I'm very curious I tried to create this world in the book that I'm not sure I did. I would love to recreate late 19th century uh, Istanbul, particularly not because of the glitz and the glamour, because of the the amazing mix of people that existed there and the sense of possibility. I would love to live for a couple of days. I mean, it would be horrendous, but I would love to uh, to be in in the inner circle during this period. Cool. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Oh, God, that's easy. Uh, people think it's anti-Turkish, which boggles my mind. Uh, some people think it's like I'm trying to uh, um, uh, take away from the glory of the Ottoman Empire by talking about Ottoman imperialism. Or people think that I'm trying. I've been called an, an CIA agent. Uh, I've, I mean, I've had some. When the book came out in Turkish, it was shocking the reaction to be honestly like just shocking uh because people uh first of all misread the title uh to think that it is a uh, shame uh, uh me calling the ottomans these horrible pillagers of africa uh and uh, uh, uh when in reality it was the ottomans and the pillaging of africa i mean it's a long story i just don't want to explain it anymore sure. but uh but people think that it is i'm trying to uh, that i'm anti-turkish which is mind-boggling if you know me and uh, also that i am somehow trying to take away from the glory of the uh, or the benevolence of ottoman empire and of course okay. i'm neither all right let's do the last one then we have a couple of questions whose work do you admire or are inspired by i'm sure there's a long list but if there's any any that come to mind huge list uh um <laughs> i really really love the uh, writers that write in uh uh, uh, historical fiction. I yeah. love. That. I would love so much to be able to write with that. Uh, that that get this immersive feeling. I would love to do that. So Laila Lalami, I love uh, yeah. Laila Lalami, and uh, uh, of course Maluf. I love Maluf. Uh, uh, who doesn't? Uh, yeah. I mean, not all the books, but you know, uh, I, I those are Charles King. Uh, um, he did, you know, Midnight in uh, the Para Palace. Uh, I would do so the in terms of writers, in terms of historians. I have so much. I don't want to yeah. bore you. Okay, let's let's do the questions. The first one, I'll ask the first two uh, and combine them. The first one, I know the answer to. Who published your book? Um, Ottoman Scramble for uh, Africa, I think, was Stanford University Press. And, and losing Istanbul, I don't know who it is. It's Stanford University Press. Cool. Um, and then. Isam asks, how was the expansion done peacefully or by the use of arms? What expansion? The expansion uh, the into Africa. Oh, expansion into Africa during this pe uh, during this period, it was all yeah. about um, negotiations. <laughs> they didn't have the arms, bless them. They did have the arms, but the arms were actually being funneled in because they couldn't go into direct uh, conflict with France or Britain. Uh, the arms were being funneled into the Senussi uh, uh, leadership. So this period, it was all about negotiate uh, negotiations. They didn't. That is, uh, they didn't have a lot of um, uh, military power at least pre World War One, but they did definitely have. A a lot of uh, 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 political power that they were using very, very well. Very cool. So Salma, you're up next. Hi. Um, hey. I am very, very intrigued by so many things. This is such a stimulating um, conversation. I have a question or perhaps, I don't know, reflection. Um, I'm curious about the, how you read the, 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 how the identity started to come up, the identity of elites specifically in Egypt and Hejaz. Um, I mean, I I see this repetition of this celebratory story, of the legacy of the Ottomans and being, you know, con considered Turkish descendants has this, um, it's almost like boasting about it being good yeah. blood. And yeah. I see until today, very, yeah. very strongly. Um, yet, when I go back and read in books or even just speak to people in the streets 
now or read historical, like, you know, books, books on history of the time. Um, paradoxically, I still feel like when people consider Muhammad Ali dynasty, for instance, or until now, until it, uh, or until it remained a monarchy or, or in, the monarchy inherited it perhaps later in the 20th century. Um, or in the case of the Hijazi Ashraf, I feel like this identity is somehow removed from mm-hmm. the Ottoman uh, body in a way. Yeah. Um, so how do you see this contradiction it's almost like are you kidding yourself you know but like <laughs> there are things that, yeah go ahead it's please. very twilight zone-ish but you have to remember that there's a lot of people that are invested in making sure that separation remains because they are still in power and they have a different narrative about how they came to power so if uh, uh, in the Arab world very few families uh, ever leave <laughs> they're <laughs> they, if they're in power they just they're holding on to that chair so uh, people that come from Hijaz uh, shall remain nameless, who are still in power in some places, would uh, do not want to talk about the legacy of the Ottoman Empire, but more importantly, their legacy of being part of the Hijazi, as opposed to the where they rule, for instance, uh, um, a family, because that disrupts the idea of a nation state and who gets to rule it, particularly if it's a monarchy. So, um, uh, uh, so learning Ottoman history, more importantly, learning the connections of people in power to the Ottoman legacy as being part of the people in power during the imperial period disrupts the narratives uh, that keep a lot of people in power, at least partially, um, whether it is in, in, in <clears throat> I really don't want to, I, I would like to not be denied visas, so I'm not going to mention specific names. In many, many countries in, <laughs> in the Arab world, let's just put it that way, uh, many, many, including Lebanon, uh, where a lot of these families that are still holding on to their chairs and starving their population were doing the same thing under Ottoman period as feudal lords. Um, but of course, and, uh, putting them in that context as being these people that have been there for well over 100 years, sometimes 200 years in power as feudal lords, continue to be feudal lords in action, would, would not only harm their legitimacy, it would harm the very idea of a country that was built on the notion of a leader as being uh, uh, um, uh, divinely or somehow um, uh, 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 assigned to be there for a specific type uh, uh, or what do you call it, group or or a sect or 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 people. I hope that's that's I, I hope that's vague enough, but but uh, but clear enough. Yeah, thank you. I, I think also the idea of the, the maybe perhaps how this identity was um, uh, maybe got, got shaped or influenced as a result of the removal the idea of removal that happened to them later, the removal from power, forced removal, yeah. in the case of the you know 1952 revolution, or in the Ashraf with the you know British yes. or whatever that was going on. Um, very interesting. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Salma. Thanks, Salma. Okay, everybody, um, we are just out of time. Mustafa, thank you so much for doing this um, <laughs> and pleasure. for. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I still have so many questions. So maybe what we'll do is uh, your new book will come out. I will dive deep into it and then we can talk about it maybe sometime next year as well. Sounds great. Sounds great. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I rarely get to do this. So this is great. Thank you. A lot of fun. Okay, everybody. um, This conversation will go up on the podcast as well as inshallah will continue on our community platform. So if you still have questions, put them into the comments of the event link um, and we can continue the conversation there. We have two more events this week. We are speaking to DJ Habib Beats, who I love, who has one of the best... um, social media accounts exploring music from the region. And then we are speaking to uh, Noor al Ghori, who is a creative uh, powerhouse and has the rep podcast. So this will go up tomorrow. And thanks so much for being here, everybody. Mm-hmm.